This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. It's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And uh, the dates are important because things are changing so fast. This is April 20th, 2020. And supposedly people are sitting at home. I don't know what you're doing at home, but I'm sure some people are getting kind of anxious. Some people are very happy for the time off. But the date's important because what is going on in the world right now has never happened in the history of the world. I mean, I knew our leaders were screwed up, but not this screwed up. I mean, how can you shut down the whole world economy? And it's the reason that's really good news is because both the Fed and the Treasury, they're supposed to be separate, but they're now scratching each other's back, which proves they were never separate at all. And most people, that doesn't make any sense to them. But about 1999, I wrote this book. It's called Rich Dad's Prophecy. And it says why the biggest stock market crash in history is still coming and how you can prepare yourself and profit from it. And the crash market, the market I was talking about was the dot-com market in 2000 of the Y2K crash. And since then, we had the 2008 crash. And, if you, and, and I called it. I was on Wolf Blitzer's program in January of 2008, and I said, Lehman Brothers was going to go down. And Wolf going, oh, da, 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 da. So if you don't believe me, go to a Rich Dad. And you can see me on CNN with Wolf Blitzer with one of the agents of Wall Street. I won't mention her name. But anyway. Anyway, I said, this book here said 1999. So I was calling it way out. 2016 would be the crash date. What I did not foresee was quantitative easing and ZERP nor did I see the shutting down the whole damn world economy. So the crash is bigger than I thought. So in March of 2020 was the biggest crash in world history of the stock market, but nobody knows anything about it because everybody's quarantined at home thinking about coronavirus and, and social distancing and wearing face masks. So people are missing out on one of the biggest catastrophic cash heist in the history of the world. They don't even know what's happening. Now, the good news is, it's the good news and the bad news about money. I'm going to make a fortune. This is the best, this is the best time if you're ready for it. So I want you guys who are sitting at home, you know, licking your wounds and wondering when you're going to go back to work and so you can get your lattes and cappuccinos and pizzas. Just know you might be missing one of the biggest opportunities in the history of the world because our governments have really screwed up. And I won't talk about conspiracy, but something's fishy about this corona crisis. There's something very fit. Why did they have to shut down the whole damn world? And I think it's because they're covering up something very, very big. And in December, I mean, September 2019, the shadow banking system collapsed. And that's why the Fed and the Treasury are printing tens of trillions of dollars all over the world. So when Corona appeared, I think it was an excuse to shut down the world economy to cover up what really happened. Now, again, this is the Rich Dad Radio Show. It's the good news and bad news about money. I'm getting sexually stimulated thinking about how much money I'm going to make. But if you're feeling bad, this is your program. If you're worried about what's going to happen to moi, this is your program. So we're here to save your soul and your checkbook. And our guest today is an old friend of ours, Jeff Wang. He is the expert on crypto. And I love crypto. I don't have any. I have a little bit. But the reason I like crypto is for one reason. It's outside the system. It doesn't depend on the Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank, or the Treasury, or Wall Street. Now, you like Wall Street. You, you believe in investing for the long term in the stock market for your retirement. I'll take laps around the rosary beads tonight. You're screwed. I mean, you really are screwed up if you think you're going to retire on that. You don't care how young you are. So anyway, we have Jeff Wang, and I want to talk. he's going to talk about crypto, the good, the bad, the ugly of crypto. So Jeff is in San Francisco right now. So Jeff, welcome to the program. Please give us a little bit of your background. Hello there. So I'm a technologist from a bunch of big tech companies. I uh, recently joined a startup that we just raised $24 million called Tonkin. Uh, but I've been involved in crypto for quite a while now. And we started as an investment group. 
and just getting into the whole craze. Uh, but then we found out we had to mobilize. We actually had to create a whole group up. We call ourselves rocketfuel.team. And actually our deals started from just like a couple thousand each initially to millions of dollars uh, after we started piling on the profits over and over again. Uh, so we got really into the space. We know everything from the good and the bad of the space. Uh, but really for me, my philosophy is to be a technologist first and then go from a VC investor mindset as to what's happening in the future. So we can go by year by year play if we want later. But overall, uh, I feel like that's how we got into the space and that's why we're still writing about the space because it's constantly evolving and it, it grows increasingly more complex. Correct, so uh, could you explain how Bitcoin is separate from the Fed, the Treasury and Wall Street? That's, see, that's the reason I endorsed it. I don't trust those guys. If you trust them, buy mutual funds, right? So first thing to realize is Bitcoin is a digital currency, which is kind of strange because if me and you wanted to make a digital currency, what does that even mean, right? Do, do you control some ledger, some Excel sheet that has how much we both have? So Bitcoin came out around using this blockchain technology so that both of us actually control the same ledger. The same source of record is controlled by both of us. And later on, that ledger grew to thousands and thousands of other operators. And all Bitcoin is, is a history of the transactions from different keys. So as long as I have a 64 digit key, that stores money. And I could use that key to send you money and you could use your key and send other people money. Nobody controls it. Nobody can just stop it, right? I can just ban Bitcoin. There's no, there's no way you can ban Bitcoin. So it's floating out there across borders. There's no borders for Bitcoin, but it's being traded for other assets. It's actually the biggest asset to trade into other cryptocurrencies. So when we say that it cannot be governed or there's no policy around Bitcoin, there's just simply no way to control it. Well, so my point here is this, okay? As the governments right now, all over the world are printing literally trillions of dollars and they're trying to, they're trying to pay off debt that's denominated in dollars. So that means the US dollar gets stronger because they need dollars to pay off the debt. And when you heard that they were printing trillions of dollars, as a Bitcoin person, what goes through your mind? Is that good or bad for you? Um, if you are heavy in Bitcoin, it is good for you because Bitcoin has been inversely correlated with the dollar uh, in terms of the dollar compared to the other basket of currencies. So if the dollar crashes or goes bad, Bitcoin is going to go up historically. That's just how it's happened. Uh, Bitcoin has also been tied to other assets, but only in various times uh, to get just a brief summary. Bitcoin was pretty much tied to the S&P 500 for a little bit. And then as the oil crashed in uh, March, I believe, everything got liquidated. So Bitcoin is considered a risky asset because it is volatile. And then it was, no, it was not shielded away from all the capital being taken out of the markets. So I just wanna make sure to be, that people realize it's not really correlated with any asset. I'd say it's like a hedge or a, actually insurance to any other assets that you're holding. Yes, and that's exactly the term I use. I, you see my last tweet I talk about, I don't consider Bitcoin, gold, or silver investments. I concern them insurance policies against the idiots running the Fed, the Treasury, and Wall Street. And they're a bunch of criminals as far as I'm concerned because they're printing trillions of trillions of dollars at the same time causing billions of people to go unemployed. Are you nuts? Are you nuts? I mean, I can't, this is like heaven. Uh, but I know for people sitting at home, they're going, oh, I've lost my job. I can't pay my mortgage. And I understand, you know, you can't pay the car payments and all this. But the name of this program is the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. So if you're sitting at home contemplating your navel, navel saying, well, can I get my cocktailing job back? Or, you know, what restaurant am I going to work for next? I think you missed the biggest opportunity in world history. That's my point of view. So as a crypto guy, uh, could you, what would you say to somebody who thinks this is a bad time? Why is it a good time for you guys? Well, we actually analyze uh, every crypto, well, not every cryptocurrency, the major cryptocurrencies on a milestone basis. So in different month periods, we actually predict kind of what prices each coin is going to go. And over the long run, it's, it gets harder and harder to, to analyze, obviously, uh, even with the coronavirus fears and we don't know when people are coming back, it's getting harder to project almost any asset. But if you do have a thesis that the dollar is going to decrease in value compared to other currencies, if you go by the thesis, Bitcoin will eventually, you know, should go up in the long term. Cryptocurrencies as a whole, we can get into that. It's a whole ecosystem out there. 
also it starts benefiting from the decentralization of governments and their policies as well. Okay, and so today's April 20th, 2020. What's the price of Bitcoin today? It's about uh, 6,800, I believe. 6,800, do you consider it high or low? I consider it at the right price. Uh, I'll tell you uh, what our newsletter said. We predicted Bitcoin to be $10,000 by May uh, because of, uh, it's a thing called the halvening Having. that's happening in May. Yeah, the halving, the halvening, it's a, it's a joke because halvening is not really the word. Um, but the inflation for Bitcoin is going to get cut in half. So based off our newsletter, we have milestone base, you know, uh, price points. We thought $10,000 by May. So I actually hit $10,000 in February. So we were like, okay, well, here we are. We've reached our point. What happens next? Uh, after oil crashed in March, it crashed again today to negatives. But when it crashed in March, uh, all the capital came out of Bitcoin. That was a great opportunity, again, to put your money in. I predict, though, that after the happening, there will be less mining incentive. So if inflation is cut, there's less infrastructure to support the system because it's just not going to you know, be break even. Okay, so I do Jeff, think, yeah, hey, I just want to say Bitcoin is going to go down, I think, in May is my prediction. It's going to go down. Well, that's good news. Yeah. So in May, there will be a correction that is a good place to get in. Is my, you know, just my opinion. Right, 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 right. That's all this. And, and by the way, Rich Dad makes no recommendations. We don't say buy this or sell that or do this or do that. We're purely an educational company. So we have our producer here, uh, Sarah, and she doesn't trust you guys. So Sarah, <laughs> what question do you have to ask? Jeff, I trust you wholeheartedly. <laughs> I don't understand. So you have to understand I'm asking these questions out of pure ignorance. Mm -hmm. um, so two years ago, I know Bitcoin was around 20,000, I want to say, like it was around that peak. And I was telling Robert that I don't understand. It, it's as volatile to me as the stock market. So mm -hmm. you really have to play the same kind of game as the stock market. And so I'm not understanding what's the, where's this benefit? Where, as you know, if I were an investor, looking to buy Bitcoin? Yeah, so I don't think Bitcoin itself as, as a currency. It, it's not something that I would go out and spend it. There's just too many problems with the volatility. There's actually very slow transaction speeds. For me, what I look at is the technology itself, how that can be applied to other use cases in the world, uh, which we'll go into, I'm sure, later. And that is where I look. So I, I don't actually have that much Bitcoin. I actually look at Ethereum. I look at the decentralized finance projects of where Ethereum is going. And there's a lot of startups that are trying to scale blockchain technology as well that I look into, into also. Uh, so as an investor in Bitcoin, uh, I would just put that as a diversification piece. I wouldn't say that's like something to go all in that I'm going to use it to spend as a global currency. That's not the case. So you wouldn't invest in it because it's going to go to 100,000? I do not think it's going to go to 100,000. I, I understand that, but you, would, you wouldn't use that, that logic. No, because that's what people that's do. That's logic. Yeah. But uh, see, people do that with silver and gold. Mm-hmm. You know, people are, you know, like they're calling for $50,000 gold and $20,000 silver. And that sucks a lot of people in. Yep. So what would you say to that? So somebody says Bitcoin's going to 100,000. Why would you say that's a bad idea or you, you wouldn't touch it? I, I can give a few data points as to what happens with the other countries that have infl uh, currency crashes. They actually fled to Bitcoin as a safe haven because it's one way to get out, right? You could buy Bitcoin. It holds its currency against a USD. And then if their currency goes hyperinflation, they still have some, some digital asset that can be traded. Although again, it's just on a USB drive or it's on a piece of paper, but it, at least they can flood to that as a safe haven. Uh, with gold and silver, it's actually kind of hard to trade it for some people globally. Uh, with Bitcoin, it's 24 seven, you can trade it whenever you want. So that's where, where I say is kind of the difference between gold and silver. Um, in terms of what is backing Bitcoin, uh, mainly it's kind of the trading volume and then the entrance, it's a fiat gateway into other cryptocurrencies. So I'll, I'll let you take over from here because you guys are way over my head. I have some Ethereum. What is Ethereum? So Ethereum takes blockchain technology and it added a concept called smart contracts. So basically I could create a smart contract between you and me, Robert. It's just a, a, a auditable piece of code that we can send money to. And let's say you're paying me salary, $100 a week for whatever, just to be on the phone to call you. So you can just put in $10,000 in this smart contract and it'll automatically pay me. There'll be no bank in between. There's nothing in between at all. Me and you could just operate on this small little piece of code that does any mainstream thing. So people took that concept and they built entire applications on it. So entire applications that can do almost anything. 
Uh, it's a little bit slow right now, so it's not shown any real value in the world yet, but the, <laughs> the advancements of Ethereum 2.0, which are coming later this year, are trying to remedy that problem. Okay. So when we come back, we're going to, we'll let Jeff continue on to talk about what he knows about, you know, especially what happens if we go to U.S. Federal Reserve crypto or Chinese crypto and all that, because that's kind of the rumors I hear out there in the market. And so my question is, why buy Bitcoin or Ethereum if everybody can manufacture it? So when we come back, we'll be talking to Jeff Wang. Again, he's a, sec he's a second appearance on Rich Dad, and he's our go-to guy when I need to know what the hell's going on with the cyber world. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about crypto. Anyway, uh, you can listen to Rich Dad anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android and YouTube. And please leave us, a, leave us a review whenever you listen. And once again, all of our podcasts are I've archived at richdadradio.com. And we archive it there because you know, repetition is how we learn better. So this is a very important subject called the crypto world of either, you know, of money, because that's where we're going, like it or not. So you can listen to this program again at richdadradio.com, but most importantly, have friends, family, or business associates listen to this and discuss it to open up people's minds. Once again, we do not recommend you buy, sell, or trade. We're not rec you know, we don't make no commissions on any of this stuff, which is purely educational. So our gift today is Jeff Wang. He's the second appearance of the Rich Dad Show. He's the host of rocketfuelcrypto.com, rocketfuelcrypto.com, and part of the Avid Investment Group, Rocket Fuel Team, has invested over 40 blockchain projects. So he's more an investor in this whole world. And he's a technologist from Cisco, Salesforce, and has recently joined the, automatic, the automation startup Tonkean, T-O-N-K-E-N, which announced a $24 million raise last week. And has also filed two blockchain patents in the last year. So this guy knows what he's talking about. So he's not like me, just sitting around trying to make a few bucks here. So Jeff, you know, my concern as an old guy is what's to prevent all everybody from just coming out with their own crypto. Like, you know, what's this Facebook has that, what do they have now? Libra. Libra. What the hell is that? So it, it might help to kind of talk about the advancement of cryptocurrency through the years. Uh, 2017, 2018, when we saw the, the heights of the bubble, uh, we saw it was like a year of speculation. People thought this, is, this technology would change the world, but no one really knew why. So all these startups came up to fruition. They had initial coin offerings, ICOs. People had this value creation from thin air, from just ideas, from just white paper, right? But money did fly into the ecosystem. A lot of smart people were in there making these startups. And then 2019 hit, we kind of figured out, well, is there a product market fit? Nobody is really gonna use this if it comes out, right? So a lot of money then came out of crypto. So right now, there's the only form of investing in crypto right now that's popular is the initial exchange offering, the IEO. And those are still very profitable and that's stuff we talk about in the newsletter. But right now is a globalization on this technology. Just this year, the World Economic Forum published the CBDC framework. CBDC stands for Central Bank Digital Currency. So it actually is teaching all these countries how to make their own cryptocurrencies. China has been ahead of the curve the whole time. They are coming out with theirs this year, very likely. They already have a pilot out. Theirs is called DECP, Digital, Exchange, uh, sorry, Digital Currency Electronic Payment, DCEP. So I know you wanted to say something. I'll let you, I, I'll pause there. No, no, no. I mean, so, so, so my whole, my limited experience, the reason I like gold and silver, it takes a lot of time and money to pull that crap out of the gun. Cause I've started to, I started a gold mine in China and the Chinese took it. And I had a silver mine in Argentina, which I still have. And so I understand mining from that point of, I understand the public markets. I took them through IPOs on the Toronto stock exchange. I just don't understand your world. What's to prevent, you know, so that's why I'm asking you, what about Libra? What about, what about the Fed coin? You said that they're not coming out with one, but what, how do we maintain value if everybody's going to just make their own coins or whatever let's, they do? Let's look at each of them individually. Facebook obviously is a central entity. It's a company that is creating a non, non, not for profit organization that's rallied around a, a organization of different people. So like we have, 
venture capitalists, we have utility companies, we have payment companies, we have like Uber is involved, for example. And nobody actually owns this, this uh, association. Everyone just has a vote. And they had created a currency that they were, uh, they originally were gonna back it as one currency. Now it's gonna be multiple currencies tied to each currency in the country. So USD coin, you'll have a pound coin, a euro coin. That's one, that's one model, right? The other model is the China model where they say, this is going to be China's currency. And we are going to distribute it through all our tech companies. They already have Tencent involved, they have Alibaba and all their biggest banks, they're all involved in distributing this currency. And the question is like, how, how is this gonna change the world? How is this gonna affect other cryptocurrencies, right? And how it will affect them is a little more unclear other than the fact that it does provide another means to get to outside of the system. Because what we're talking about right now is still a centralized system, either from the top, the top down, which is China going down to the people, or Facebook and up, right? Going from the people to the governments. Now, Facebook is running into huge resistance from other governments from going across borders. China just does what China wants. They say, we want a currency, we're gonna make it. So now oh, you want so to say something. When, when, when you mention Facebook, are you talking about Libra or just Facebook having its own? So Facebook lost me a has, long time ago. Yeah, Facebook will get in trouble if they say that it is their currency. So what they've done is they funded a, another entity in Geneva that is going to be the owner of this new currency. So they have tried to detach themselves away from it as much as possible. So why would, what's the advantage to Facebook for having a labor? The reason I mentioned that is because more people know about Facebook and this thing called labor than the other sh stuff you mentioned. So why would Facebook want to start Libra? So the primary reason is to expand into other countries that don't have very good banking systems. So if all I need again is a key to generate a wallet, to accept payments, I can now build a business in any country as long as there's money coming in, as long as money can be transferred within that country. That's what, that's, so that's the Facebook's primary reason to begin with. So it's gonna bypass the banking system and the business system of let's say our Spain. Is that what yes. it's doing? Or, or in unbanked areas like in Africa, where it's harder to get a bank account, it's harder to get uh, money f into Africa or convert it into a US dollar equivalent. So the moment you have that money within the country, you actually have a payment system already set up all around Facebook's ecosystem. They have their own wallet called Calibra. And basically you can run a business entirely on Facebook's infrastructure. Now, when you so, have China, China is having another approach. Wait, 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 so stay on Facebook. So Facebook will start its own ecosystem internally with Libra. Correct. And so the, why would a country, let's say Kenya, not like it? Or why would they like it? there'll be less dependence on whatever local currency there's gonna be, right? Like if Kenya has a currency that's tied to some value, all of a sudden there's this other payments system that's coming in and people might just accept Libra with that business. You could run your Facebook marketplace page, you can accept payments with Libra, and then you could interact with anybody around the world as long as you're using Libra, right? So why can't they do that with Bitcoin? So again, we talked about with the volatility of Bitcoin and the transfer speed of Bitcoin has issues. So Bitcoin, you don't want to spend Bitcoin because it's fluctuating in value. You might feel bad if you, you bought a coffee and then Bitcoin went up in value, right, for example. Also, Bitcoin does take around, it takes a few minutes to actually send. So I, again, I personally don't consider Bitcoin a currency. I, I do consider it more of a store of value or an insurance against other fluctuating markets. Okay. So the other countries would not want Libra simply because you compete with their central bank. Correct. And so how much pushback are they getting? So much pushback. I believe uh, a few European countries have already banned Libra. They said like, there's no way this is gonna fly, right? Until, unless, unless Libra was pegged by the Euro, right? And then you could transfer Euro in and out. Okay, so what's happening with China? I, I hear they're gonna, China's gonna have a gold back crypto. Uh, actually, so they were making an RMB version of their currency. Uh, it's going to be distributed through their top, uh, you know, all the big tech companies, all the banks, they all have the implementation in the app. And basically you will still own the money. Like you can sign into any app with your bank account, if that makes sense, right? No. I use my key for this and I can spend the money there. It's, it's actually a very novel idea. On the flip side, if I'm a foreigner visiting China, I actually need to verify my identity and I need to use that system. I'm not gonna be able to use cash like I was before. 
cash we'll see probably go away as a result of the DCP. Right. China's already cashless. Yeah. Yeah. So you make money betting on the future success of these things? Are they investing in them or how do you make, because you're not, you're not buying Bitcoin like I would buy it as a, as a hedge. You, you're buying it more in the, like I did when I, when I created my mining company in China to take it public, I was doing it for the shares of C Canadian stock. Yeah. So it's, uh, it is a little complicated because they're still structured as some sort of agreement. Uh, in venture capital, there's a thing called like a convertible note. I can, uh, you know, either lend you money and then it converts to equity. In this case, a lot of these projects, they're convertible to tokens, which is really a unit of measurement. A token is just simply something sitting on their blockchain or an Ethereum representation of that unit of service. And then that, is, that has some value if their startup goes live. So we would be helping out these companies, lending them money for convertible to token, and then using that token for their ecosystem. Uh, and then this eventually became ICOs. It eventually became IEOs. Uh, and then uh, well, what's, it's, what's it's an IEO like, is a uh, uh, initial internet. exchange offering. So basically oh. now the crypto exchanges are offering these currencies. See, that's what I mean. It, it's, it's, it's no more than what I saw going on in wall street. The reason I don't like stocks and mutual funds is I know that game too well mm -hmm. and I don't trust it. So I'm, I'm, I'm clearly 100% out of the stock market because they can play so many games around a stock as you know. And so when I finally got out of my, I got, when, the, when China took my gold mine, you know, I realized then it was cheaper to buy gold. <laughs> to try, I raised $27 million for this gold mine in hopes that I would get my money back when I think went public through an IPO. You guys call them ICOs. So I was doing it for the stock. I wasn't doing it for the gold. Does that, you know, that makes any sense to people listening. Is that similar to what you, how your mind works? So with different currencies, there's a different milestone kind of structure. Basically in a stock market, you have uh, like a revenue, right? Revenue is growing, number of customers is growing, adoption is growing, number of users. With cryptocurrencies, it's more about, well, does the technology actually work? That's one milestone, right? Does it, did it launch on the testnet successfully? Uh, what is, did it list on different crypto exchanges successfully? Uh, is there different media events that they have to announce different things? It's completely speculative, right? It's not even getting to the market, to the public market fit. It's more about the technology, the development, and then the, hi the hype, right? So, so in our newsletter, we, we be sure to, to point that out and not get fooled by it as well. Okay, so somebody like me comes to you and you guys have raised 24 million. So I'm kind of hoping to be one of the insiders, you know, called the founding you know, when you read a stock offering, it says founding shareholders. I always wanted to be the founding shareholder. I didn't want to be a shareholder. I want to be a founding shareholder. I want to be buying my shares at a penny and exiting at 25 cents. That was the game. Is that similar to what you guys do? It's exactly what it is, right? All, all of these ICOs, IEOs are purely from the seed round. So people don't have any money right now. They're raising money to start their startup. The problem is startups in general have what less than a 1% chance of exit. Uh, but these coins go liquid, liquid immediately, right? Once they go on the exchange, they're liquid. They can fluctuate in price. Uh, there was a project that had Google sign on as a partner and then it went up like 700%. So you're just wondering like, okay, uh, is this sustainable in the long term? right? Obviously that one partnership, it doesn't mean it's 7x the value. So basically long term, you have to be very careful as to when price jumps happen. But there's also moments in time where you can kind of say this price is actually low enough to speculate on and hope for that big jump, right? So is that what rocket fuel team does? You guys advise people on what's hot and what's not, what's coming on, what to watch out for? So we talk to startups uh, in the seed round stage, if they, you know, are, is their idea even good, right? Is it, is it not a scam, right? We don't wanna work with you if you're just gonna try to make money out of it and leave, right? So what we, what we try to do is just analyze the company, see if it's worthwhile, we have a network of other venture capitalist firms as well. And we just make sure that everybody's, you know, on the same page that this isn't right. some scam for investors. We're not even talking about the public yet, right? It gets, it becomes a scam to the public for other projects elsewhere, but we want to make sure that what we put money in, if we put money with Ethereum into a startup, that it is indeed a good startup, right? We look at the team, we look at the economics and we look at other things. 
Would you recommend anybody buy Bitcoin as a hedge right now? I mean, you know, like a guy like me, only, the reason I get excited about it is they tell me it's going to go to 100,000. So, you know, idiot like me will just jump right in. Tell me where I'm screwed up thinking like that. I think it is not, it's not likely to go to 100,000, right? I can't imagine anyone buying it from somebody at $100,000. It just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I do think because there is a negative correlation to the dollar, you see the Fed printing trillions of dollars, that it is possible that, you know, Bitcoin is a good as a diversification play. If you're looking at the technology and the advancement in technology like me, I look more into Ethereum and some of the projects in Ethereum. Uh, so my Bitcoin holding is actually very low. I, I anticipate a drop in May, like I said, just because inflation will be halved, right? <laughs> so, okay, so that's coming in May. Correct. The news, though, I think will probably push the price up just because that's what's, what news does. What's the possibility that, you know, there's a rich dad Bitcoin and everybody's out there pumping their own Bitcoin or their own cyber currency? Is that possible? It happens all the time in this world. Uh, I try to scold people that do that all the time. If you were, you know, if you were to do that, I would start asking you questions. Right, what, what's the value creation? What is it that the customer gets if they purchase this coin from you, right? And a lot of times founders just have no idea what to respond with. Right. And in those cases, I, I know it's something is fishy and then I try to get out, right? Right, so Sarah has a question for you because she doesn't trust you guys. <laughs> Again, Jeff, I trust you. I, do, no, I'm just, <laughs> I, like, I give her a hard time. <laughs> um, what stops one of the code writers or developers from hitting delete and, and wiping one of these cryptos out? So these, these currencies are all supported by a network of people, a network of servers. So the, the worst a person can do is try to attack it with hardware. And then that's just going to be futile. It's, gonna, it's not going to work. Like you could, you can turn off a server, but the whole network of servers still exists with this ledger. So in, in, in a short summary, it's, it's not really possible. But isn't that because it's open source? I mean, this, it's not like in a centralized location. Correct. It is completely distributed amongst thousands and thousands of servers. Right. So you wipe one out, you have to go 10,000 guys to get it, get it all wiped out. And then you also have no idea who these guys are. Right. The last question I have is this, is, you know, Peter Schiff, he's, he is, uh, he's a gold and silver guy. And somebody gave him some Bitcoin. He lost it. <laughs> How does that, how does a person lose Bitcoin? So the, the 64 digit key we talked about with whether it's on a USB drive, whether it's on your phone or a piece of paper, if you lose that, then you cannot transfer that coin out or the, those coins out. So that is one of the biggest, uh, you know, things that's bugging crypto right now. How do we keep cryptocurrency keys and key management in a better format? And that's other, you know, in, in all the technologies that we're exploring, that's definitely one area we're looking at as well. So how does a person like me not lose my key or whatever it is? Uh, the typical way is having a backup and then putting it in your sock drawer on a piece of paper. <laughs> you can also well, have copies elsewhere too, but that's dangerous. Well, Jeff, I really appreciate your insights and educating the group here. And we'll have you back on because, you know, I really have, I am very confident that what you're, what you're on is the future. And to me, what crypto is like right now is like what AOL was back in the 90s. And it, they just kept improving it, kept improving it, kept improving it. So, you know, you guys are on to it, but it's called developmental. It's not proven just at this point. So how do people stay in touch with you to find out what your services are? Because it, it sounds like a very valuable service given how you know, how crazy it is. I mean, if everybody can start a, their own crypto, you know, you're, you're a valuable resource for them. So how do people stay in touch with you? So if you want to sign up for our newsletter, it's at rocketfuelcrypto.com. How much is that? That is about $47 a month. There is a free trial though. You can always see if it's good for you or not. Uh, you get access to weekly videos and a monthly newsletter. Outstanding. Yeah, I, I really give you, I mean, I, to me, it's just fascinating because you know, we're generations apart. But one day I decided, why am I, you know, wouldn't it be better just to buy a gold mine and sell the shares to the gold mine? And then, then I quickly realized it was better I just buy the gold. But anyway, you know, Jeff, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for being part of our program. All right, man. Thanks for having me. Talk thank to you later. You. Take care. Bye. So I want to thank you all guys listening for this very important subject. 
you know, this cryptocurrency thing is the future, but there's going to be a lot of ups, downs, scams, losses, some tears, and all this. But that's why we have our program. Once again, we don't recommend or endorse any project or any investment. We're purely educational. So thank you for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show.